Why do we learn about history? How do we find meaning in events that seem so foreign and distant from our fast-paced, social media-driven existences? Why should we learn about the negative events of our past? The answer is, so they don't happen again. There is a dusty road centered between two fields in southeastern Arkansas. At the end of that road is a cemetery. As you walk among the headstones, you can't help but wonder how we got to this place. How we decided that our countrymen were such a threat that their freedom had to be stolen. The story that we tell is not new, but it is significant to our nation, state, and local communities. It is a story of a time when fear was greater than justice, a time when an undeserving group of people were punished because society was afraid. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Fear and uncertainty has the ability to change everything, and the ideas and feelings of some in American society after Pearl Harbor were no exception. It's as if American society had forgotten our foundational principles of liberty and justice for all, and traded them for suspicion and contempt. We all live with this preconceived notion that American citizenship should mean something, like it means freedom and equality and justice and liberty for all people. Unfortunately, time and time again throughout history, we've seen that fear is the enemy of reason. And that was certainly the case for the Japanese. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, our West Coast became a potential combat zone. Living in that zone were more than 100,000 persons of Japanese ancestry, two thirds of them American citizens, one third aliens. We knew that some among them were potentially dangerous where the Japanese Americans were like known for not bringing crops to this country and they were very peaceful people. Under Executive Order 9066, any person of Japanese descent, including a large percentage of American citizens, were moved to relocation camps in the western United States. Ten camps were set up, including two in Arkansas, at Rower, and Jerome. Those that went to Arkansas were shipped here on a train, and it was a four-day train ride. And they had not been really told what to expect. And so there was one guy who said that at one point the train had stopped, and they ordered them off the train. And it was just to stretch their legs and to maybe use the bathroom. But he was convinced that they had just shipped them out into the desert and they were just going to shoot them there and leave them in the desert. So they, they, were, they were just afraid constantly for most of the beginning of this, uh, most of the process. Evacuation. More than 100,000 men, women and children, all of Japanese ancestry, removed from their homes in the Pacific Coast state to wartime communities established in out-of-the-way places. The evacuation order was not well publicized a marked departure from FDR's cozy fireside chats and other public addresses. So when they were at the assembly centers, they, well, before they were sent to the assembly centers, each family was given a number. And so your family number held on to through the entire situation, really into the end. Citizens were given very little time to collect their belongings. Most lost everything, including their homes and businesses. I had to forget all that was taught to me about our democratic country. I cannot put into words the feeling I had when we had to sell our furniture, to see another man, smiling, drive our new car away forever. I hope in the near future we will be able to go outside and lead a life like we used to in Los Angeles, to lead a life like any other red-blooded American. Takeo Shibata their evacuation did not imply individual disloyalty, but was ordered to reduce a military hazard at a time when danger of invasion was great. 
two-thirds of the evacuees are American citizens by right of birth. The rest are their Japanese-born parents and grandparents. The people are not under suspicion. They are not prisoners. They are not internees. They are merely dislocated people, the unwounded casualties of war. These people that were being loaded on these train cars and these like flatbed type things, they were American citizens and family of American citizens and they were looked at as guilty or evil and they hadn't done anything wrong to be looked at that way. It's kind of like guilty until proven innocent, but they had done literally nothing. They were being judged by the color of their skin and their ethnicity. Arkansas was chosen because of its publicly held land, which afforded work opportunities for those interned, including the cultivation of food. Each center had medical facilities and other trades where the internees could find work. Can you imagine what it's like to get off a truck and just be in the middle of rural Arkansas? The Japanese had to take all their possessions with them to the camps, otherwise they'd be lost. But Arkansans were not happy with Governor Homer Atkins' decision to allow the Japanese to live in Arkansas, even if he subsequently passed laws that stated they cannot work outside the camps, purchase their own land in Arkansas, or attend institutions of higher education. They resented the conditions within the camps, which were often better than most Arkansans living in the Delta in the 1940s. They were not, they did not want them at first. Homer Atkins was the governor, and he was a rascal. For the, for the most part, Homer Atkins was a white supremacist, and he was completely opposed to internment. And then after a while, when the government started dangling a little bit of money in his face, he just said, well, they can come. We can have the camps here, but they can't work outside the camp. Uh, and when their internment is over, they need to leave. And so, but some of the communities surrounding, the community surrounding both of these camps, uh, they were angry because the camps had running water, electricity, and telephone service, and no one in the communities had any of that. So there was a little bit of friction there. Life in the camps was a lot different from what they were used to because, you know, the father was your dominating figure of the family. And when they got into camp, life was completely different. Uh, the women, they couldn't cook in the barracks. It was a mess hall, each block had a mess hall. And it was very demeaning to the elder Japanese to not be able to have the control over their family that they had. Special emphasis was put on the health and care of these American children of Japanese descent. These army style barracks, which were I think 120 feet long by 20 feet wide, and there were four to six apartments in each of those buildings, and so they were separated into small rooms, and 20 foot by 20 foot was the standard size room. Sometimes you could get a 30 foot by 20 foot room if you had a very large family, um, still not <laughs> very big room for a seven person family but um, so they had these small living spaces that they eventually turned into nice looking homes they put carpets down and rugs and put curtains on the windows and made furniture and they were able to create a little bit of normalcy in yeah. their life um, but for the most part it was really boring and that's why a lot of people tried to pick up so many hobbies like dancing and flower arranging and sewing and sports, art, because there was really nothing else to do other than to go to school and do a job. Education, which was highly valued by the Japanese within the camps, was another point of contention for Arkansans who lost their best educators to the higher paying federal jobs in the camps. Imagine the irony of sitting in a U.S. history classroom in one of these camps, learning about democracy and the natural rights of man when you don't have the ability to leave of your own free will. The Japanese left behind their friends and school, and because of that, they missed out on special moments in their lives, like hanging out with friends and graduation. They did nothing wrong, and they still chose to make the best of a terrible situation. I mean, we have men, we have Japanese men that are going to fight in a war 
for a country who have locked up their families for no reason. I mean, it's just truly an amazing group of people. The all-Japanese regimental combat team, the 442nd, would become the most decorated unit for its size and length of service in U.S. military history. This unit had more than 18,000 individual decorations for bravery. This concept in Japanese called gaman, and the word itself literally means patience. Um, but there's a cultural attitude or a cultural meaning that's attached to the word that means to bear a difficult situation with dignity. You fought not only the enemy, but you fought prejudice and you've won. Keep up that fight, and we'll continue to win. To make this great republic stand for just what it cons its constitution says it stands for, the welfare of all the people, all the time. The Jerome War Relocation Center was closed in June of 1944 and converted into a German prisoner of war camp. The rower camp wouldn't close until November 1945. In 1981, a federal commission was appointed to investigate Executive Order 9066 and the military's involvement. It is not usual for a government to admit its mistakes publicly, but today the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians said the U.S. government had committed a grave injustice. The commission was created by Congress three years ago to study how Japanese Americans were treated during World War II. My fellow Americans, we gather here today to right a grave wrong. More than 40 years ago, shortly after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, 120,000 persons of Japanese ancestry living in the United States were forcibly removed from their homes and placed in makeshift internment camps. This action was taken without trial, without jury. It was based solely on race, for these 120,000 were Americans of Japanese descent. I think as Americans today in our society, it's important for us to realize that it's not that big of a jump from fear to actually taking people away from their homes and putting them in camps. 244 people died in the Arkansas camps. All that has really left to Jerome is the smokestack for the medical facility they had on site at the camp. In Rower, a memorial cemetery with a monument honoring the Japanese who fought in World War II. The Japanese reaction was not one of weakness or hopelessness. It was one of quiet strength and dignity. While they understood that they were being treated unfairly, they also believed in America. In a lot of ways, they were the best Americans among us. I think it's incredibly important for us to learn about this today because it shows how easily that fear and anger and prejudice can really override our sense of human decency when things go bad. Um, it just takes one horrible event for us to turn on each other. Um, that happened at Pearl Harbor, had happened after 9-11, um, and I mean, hopefully nothing like that will ever happen again, but it's, it's easy to see how people respond to those situations and how they lash out at other people. And especially today, I mean, there's a, just a lot of prejudice still, and there's a lot of um, hostility towards people that are different. And um, so we, we need to learn that Different is okay, different doesn't mean not American.